Thank you very much for. for <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, after having seen the introduction today, I should have sent this mom and her baby straight to Athens, and uh, uh, her baby may have uh, survived. Uh, I also wonder why I have been invited, because uh, you won't need stem cells uh, to improve the outcome uh, of your premature babies based on um, the stats that I have seen. Um, so um, I was asked to um, uh, give you uh, first a primer about the um, stem cells, and then in the afternoon um, I will present uh, some data suggesting how these um, cells uh, could have benefit for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but also maybe for other complications of um, um, uh, prematurity. And so the discovery of stem cells is a Canadian one uh, by these um, two uh, very humble uh, researchers, um, uh, Till and McCulloch, in 1961. And uh, through careful research, they showed the, um, the uh, fundamental concept of a stem cell that is still valid um, today self-renewal and differentiation. Uh, you will note that these cells were discovered um, uh, six years before uh, the description of uh, the uh, um, most frequent complication of extreme um, prematurity. They also didn't call the cells stem cells. They called them colony-forming cells because this is what they observed. So they were very careful in their description. And so these are the two fundamental principles of a stem cell. Uh, it has the ability to divide, self-replicate for indefinite period. Uh, and you can see um, immediately why this is important for development, but also tissue repair and maintenance. And the second uh, uh, fundamental property is that they can uh, differentiate uh, under uh, uh, the right conditions or given the right signals. And these cells can become dependent uh, on their degree of potency any type of um, a cell uh, in the body. And you can see immediately if any dysfunction of these cells uh, could lead to either proliferation, and um, there's a very interesting hypothesis that about cancer stem cells, uh, or uh, dysfunction leading to a reduction of these um, uh, uh, stem cell uh, through stem cell exhaustion. Uh, or dysfunction that could also lead to um, uh, diseases. And uh, the um, cells also have the ability, when they self-replicate, to do a asymmetric division. So they give one cell that stays a stem cell and one cell that would differentiate. Or symmetric division, where they would give two uh, of uh, um, daughter cells that would still be stem or uh, progenitor cells. And here, Based on these uh, properties of these cells, you can see immediately why investigators thought to harness this differentiation potential of these cells uh, for uh, regenerative medicine. But we will see that these cells, in fact, act through a complete different mechanism. And of course, the prime example of a stem cell is the embryonic stem cell that can be gained at, at the blastocyst um, stage of development. And these cells are pluripotent because they can give rise to all three uh, germ uh, layers. And um, as um, uh, these cells then form specific tissues, such liver, as liver, pancreas, heart, brain, uh, these cells become more committed and lose some of their potency. And a very or the most described adult stem cell is the hematopoietic stem cell that is still multipotent. And then these um, cells, as they become more committed, again, become less potent, bipotent or unipotent. And one of the examples are the oval liver cells or in the <coughs> lung, the alveolar type 2 cell that also produces the surfactant. Um, so Till and McCulloch, the cells that this described originally were the hematopoietic stem cells. And this has led to um, the practice of bone marrow transplantation. So cell therapy is not new. What is new is the indication for regenerative medicine. And the hematopoietic stem cell can be gained, of course, from the bone marrow and gives rise to all blood cells. But it's uh, the discovery of another colony-forming uh, cell 
uh, that really ignited uh, many years after its actual discovery uh, the um, excitement for regenerative medicine uh, with cell therapy. Uh, Dr. Friedenstein um, uh, described these cells in the 70s and um, uh, as, again, colony forming unit fibroblasts because they looked like fibroblasts. And these were important niche cells uh, for the hematopoietic stem cell that would provide important information uh, to these cells so that would, they would exert the function uh, appropriately. And um, these um, uh, cells, he showed um, by careful experiments, again, had the capacity to self-renew. Uh, they also had the capability of uh, becoming uh, cartilage, fat, or um, uh, bone. And um, uh, it is uh, on, uh, approximately 20 years after the definition of these cells that investigators tested their therapeutic potential in uh, preclinical models of disease. And it's in the 1990s, end of the 1990s, uh, that the excitement of these cells um, uh, ignited. And uh, many investigators uh, started using these um, cells uh, without any clear definition of what they used because they were derived from the bone marrow. So were these hematopoietic stem cells, were these, these colony-forming unit fibroblasts. So the International Society of Cell Therapy uh, provided the minimal criteria for defining these uh, what would become multipotent mesenchymal stromal cells, or MSC. And you notice that it's mesenchymal stromal cell and not mesenchymal stem cell. Uh, and these cells have to be multipotent, um, as I um, just mentioned. Uh, they were plastic adherent, and on their cell surface, they expressed certain um, proteins uh, that would um, allow to distinguish them from other cells. And they were negative for other um, uh, cell surface protein uh, that uh, would be... Um, present on uh, macrophages, uh, for example, or on um, hematopoietic stem cells. But you can see that this definition is a bit crude, plastic adherence, uh, not very precise because uh, some uh, there were very few cell surface markers that were suggested, um, and the multipotency uh, may not apply to other mesenchymal stromal cells. But it's a definition in, in, in progress, similar to what hematopoietic stem cells were over 50 years ago. But here, um, clearly, um, you can see uh, the excitement about these uh, mesenchymal stromal cells uh, after the original description that these um, cells were capable of repairing an infarcted heart in a mouse. And there was uh, exponential um, citations in the literature and uh, research uh, performed on these uh, amazing chymal stromal cells. But still, um, we have to stay uh, critical about the, these, uh, this, this literature, and you will see uh, later this afternoon how this applies to, neonat to neonatology. A third discovery in uh, uh, stem cell biology was uh, the fact that endothelial progenitor cells, cells that can make blood vessels, exist postnatally. And uh, this was a, 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 a discovery not that long ago by Azahara et al. And he showed that uh, in the circulating blood, uh, there are uh, um, progenitor cells that have uh, endothelial um, um, properties. Uh, here he just describes the morphology uh, and um, uh, their behavior uh, in a Petri dish where he was able to culture them uh, over a three-day period. And here he was able to show that they would express certain cell surface markers that would uh, distinguish them uh, from uh, other type of uh, cells. And they also took up some uh, red fluorescent dye that is typical for uh, endothelial um, progenitor cells. Uh, but it's a neonatologist that actually put some order into uh, the nomenclature, uh, which is, again, still um, unprecise. Uh, but Merv Yoder from Indianapolis um, showed that uh, um, uh, when he takes uh, peripheral blood or cord blood, which is interesting for us as neonatologists, 
And, and uh, depending on the method of culture of these um, um, uh, mononuclear cells from the blood, he would get different types of uh, endothelial progenitor cells, which he would call early outgrowth EPCs or late outgrowth um, EPCs. And uh, the importance here is that uh, when he then plates the cells at the single cell level, so basically recapitulating the careful um, experiments that Till and McCulloch did with hematopoietic stem cell, he could show that only the late outgrowth endothelial progenitor cells were capable of forming colonies. And he was able to show that when you plate the cell at the single cell level, some did not form colonies. They were clearly mature endothelial cells. But others were able uh, to produce a lot of colonies, high proliferative potential, or HPP colonies, and some were able to uh, produce low proliferative potential. And he called these cells endothelial colony-forming cells because this is what they do. And um, here again, uh, over the past uh, um, decade, uh, people have tried to refine the definition of an endothelial progenitor cells. Here are different uh, methodologies to isolate these cells, flow cytometry from the uh, human blood. And uh, these cells uh, um, could be qualified as circulating EPCs. Do they really exist? You can see only two cell surface markers are here. Uh, um, provided to characterize these cells. Clearly, this is uh, convenient, but too little uh, or too imprecise. And in cell culture, uh, clearly, there seem to be two types of cells, the endothelial colony forming cells, the ones that actually form colonies. And then there are these um, myeloid angiogenic cells or MAX. Uh, that have no colony-forming capabilities, but still have pro-angiogenic effects. So when you look at it purely from a therapeutic perspective, both ECFCs or MACs uh, may uh, have a therapeutic uh, um, potential. Here you can see again uh, all the definition that has been given to these MACs or to these endothelial colony-forming cells. And again, uh, if you want to retain only one thing, uh, you can take a picture of this. Uh, I think this is the, this, the most simple definition you can give um, uh, today, but it's, again, like for MSCs, work in progress. However, there are some clinical implications. Uh, we see uh, now more and more um, uh, babies that have uh, hypertension as a complication or later on that have abnormal lung growth and uh, it has been um, shown over the past uh, decade that uh, lung vascular growth is crucial for normal lung growth. Um, this, uh, these two pictures here show a preterm infant with severe BPD, and in, in the angiogram, you can see the dramatic pruning of the lung vasculature in uh, the uh, distal uh, lung. Uh, likewise, um, at a young adult age, this was a former preterm baby with BPD. Uh, you can see here also on the angiogram dramatic pruning of the lung vasculature, and this per, um, sets these um, now adults up for pulmonary hypertension or, um, um, or emphysematous uh, uh, changes as well. So what we uh, were interested in um, and this is work done by a PhD in my lab, uh, Rajesh, who's now a pediatrician. Uh, what he um, had access to was uh, human um, uh, fetal lung, and uh, similar to what Merv had done with the cord blood, uh, he isolated these um, ECFCs from uh, the lung, uh, discarded the non-adherent cell, was left with only the adherent cells that indeed formed <coughs> colonies after the first week, and uh, they had this uh, cobblestone appearance, similar to what Merv had described in cord blood-derived cells. Uh, they um, expressed the CD31 uh, on their cell surface and uh, other cell, uh, cell surface uh, markers, but were negative for myeloid markers, suggesting uh, that they had the right uh, uh, sig signature on their cell surface. Uh, they um, take up LDL, 
and they bind to ULEX, again, suggesting they are endothelial in nature, and they form, uh, when you plate them on a matter gel, these cord-like um, um, structures. So it is possible to isolate endothelial-looking cells from the human lung. But what is more important is when you uh, um, inject them into, uh, under the skin of a immune-compromised mouse, uh, these cells were able to form blood vessels that then connect with the host vasculature, suggesting that uh, they can form um, blood vessels. And when you plate them at the single cell level, similar to Tillin McCulloch, Merv Yoder, we can distinguish in the human fetal lung cells that have low proliferative potential and cells that have high proliferative um, potential. And when we expose these uh, cells now to oxygen to mimic in a Petri dish what happens to our babies in the NICU, we dramatically reduce uh, the population of high proliferative potential cells, suggesting a mechanism of why preterm babies that have this stunting in their, alve in their lung vascular growth may not be able uh, to repair uh, or promote lung vascular growth which then leads to pulmonary hypertension. And of course, the corollary of that is that can we supplement uh, these babies with endothelial colony-forming cells, knowing that they exist in the cord blood. And here, the, there's an animal model that I will show you extensively uh, uh, later um, this afternoon, uh, where neonatal rats or mice are exposed to, to oxygen, um, this here is a micro CT uh, illustrating the lung vasculature. You can see the dense vascular network in a normal lung and how stunted, um, the, especially the distal lung vasculature is in oxygen-induced um, um, BPD in these um, uh, rodents. And can you, re can you um, uh, restore this vascular growth? So you have to wait until this afternoon. Uh, also, another interesting um, aspect is that uh, these ECFCs also exist in the human placenta. And you can immediately see uh, here, these are data in a normal placenta that the macrovasculature in the placenta contains these high proliferative potential um, ECFCs. What happens in preeclampsia? The, th uh, the fourth discovery that I will um, talk to you um, um, today um, may be the most um, amazing uh, amongst the, in the stem cell biology field, and it uh, was also um, awarded with the Nobel Prize in, ten, in 2010, <coughs> only four years after Yamanaka described the capability of uh, returning a completely differentiated cell, your skin cell, for example, into an embryonic-like stem cell. This opens dramatic new opportunities, uh, that, uh, and we have only scratched uh, the, the surface yet. And I will show you in four slides what this potential could be. So I showed you that the embryonic stem cell is the ultimate um, stem cell that is um, uh, pluripotent and can um, form all uh, um, three... Uh, uh, layers, uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and uh, that will then form the different organs. Uh, with this, these reprogramming factors, called now the Yamanaka factors, only four overexpression of transcription factors can turn a somatic cell, and he has shown this with either um, a skin cell or a, a blood cell, uh, that he can uh, um, make an in induced pluripotent stem cell that has embryonic uh, cell-like uh, uh, function because it can form uh, all three um, layers. And uh, if you know how to differentiate uh, the cells into the different organs, you can achieve that in a Petri dish. And uh, this is, of course, um, <laughs> intense uh, work uh, in uh, uh, progress. So this is what you can do. You can have a normal uh, individual or a patient. You can uh, take a skin biopsy. Then you get 
terminally differentiated skin fibroblast, then you reprogram these cells with the Yamanaka factors, and it's a very robust technique. That's why uh, so many people are working on it, and that's why it was um, uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize. And then you have what he called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. And these iPSCs now, because they are pluripotent, you can differentiate them into your favorite cell. What can you do then with these cells? You can either use them for cell replacement therapy, or you can um, study them in a petri dish for disease modeling, because now you have basically a patient-specific embryonic-like stem cell. Or you can do drug discovery, and this is really the beginning of uh, true personalized um, medicine. Here's what can be done in an animal model, and uh, this has already been started now uh, to be done in uh, clinical trials. You can have an, uh, a mouse model of sickle cell anemia. You collect the skin uh, uh, cells of this mouse. You reprogram it. Here are the four Yamanaka factors, OCT4, SOX2, K, LF4, and CMIC. And then you have these um, um, iPSC um, from uh, this mouse with sickle cell anemia. What can you do with these cells now in the Petri dish? You can correct the mutation. In parallel to the discovery of iPSCs, um, you have now genome editing tools that have dramatically moved uh, from complicated to a little bit simple uh, uh, to simpler. And currently, we're at the CRISPR-Cas9 level. And you can use this um, technique uh, to correct the mutation. Now, you have a normal iPSC cell uh, from this originally sick mouse. And uh, you can then differentiate uh, these iPSCs into blood cells, inject them, and you can correct um, uh, the, the gene uh, mutation. And uh, you can imagine the excitement in the field uh, for uh, genetic, genetic diseases that currently uh, can't be um, treated. So you can do the opposite, too. You can have a healthy patient. Uh, you take the fibroblast, make iPSCs, and then you can create a gene mutation in this uh, patient. Uh, the goal is then to understand what is uh, this mutation doing and uh, how can you eventually correct uh, the phenotype, not necessarily with complex uh, genetic um, uh, manipulations, but with drugs, so you can repurpose um, drugs. And this has led to one of the drugs for um, cystic fibrosis. Or you can do in humans what I just described in uh, the, the mouse. So of course, in our lab, we're interested in uh, uh, lung diseases, and there are genetic lung diseases, such as surfactant protein B or ABCA3 deficiency. You can take uh, the skin or uh, blood uh, cord blood from a healthy uh, baby or a patient, and then you do the same manipulation, um, reprogramming into iPSCs, and if you know how to do this in vitro differentiation into alveolar type 2 cell, and there are now more and more sophisticated techniques, and Daryl Cotton in Boston is clearly the, the leader in the field, and then you can do disease modeling, drug discovery, or cell replacement therapy. We have done this cell replacement therapy in a surfactant protein B uh, deficiency model in mice. Uh, the, the, the issue here is uh, cell engraftment. And um, uh, this is a problem that uh, we haven't um, uh, solved yet. And so we have resolved for now to an, uh, a gene uh, therapy approach that is amazingly promising. This, the, the mice, instead of dying after five days, they survive up to six months, which is the equivalent of 30 years in humans. But so what uh, we did, uh, what I show here is that uh, we can differentiate these um, uh, cells using the protocol by Daryl Cotton. Uh, we can look at the lamella bodies in uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy here, the characteristic uh, lamella bodies. And then uh, we can do some um, in vitro testing of surfactant synthesis here. This is a, a human iPSC that hasn't been differentiated, no surfactant production. 
But here in the human iPSC that has that is has been derived now into an alveolar type two cell, uh, we can see uh, surfactant um, um, production. And these are tests that could be used um, to evaluate new drugs um, in. Uh, uh, surfactant protein B deficiency, for, for example, or as shown here for ABCA3. So here we differentiated uh, a human iPSC from a patient with ABCA3 deficiency. And you can see here the healthy donor has this characteristic of um, a um, uh, lysosome marker, uh, TEM, nice lamellar bodies, and of course ABC expression. Here, in a Petri dish, these cells that have been obtained from uh, the patient with ABCA3 mutation has a complete different phenotype uh, in terms of uh, lysotracker red. Uh, we uh, can't see uh, a lot of normal lamella bodies, and definitely there is no ABCAC expression. So here we have created a disease in a dish, and we can see now if uh, using drugs or uh, genetic uh, genome editing, we can restore these um, characteristics. So this is um, uh, the future uh, or the potential mm -hmm. of uh, induced um, um, pluripotent stem cells. So as a summary for this uh, stem cell primer, uh, the fundamental properties of a stem cell is the capacity to self-renew and differentiate. And uh, this is, of course, important for normal development, but also postnatally for maintenance of uh, tissue at steady state, or if you have a disease for repair. And hopefully exogenous um, uh, stem cells through cell therapy may be uh, a game changer in uh, neonatology, such as uh, surfactant was uh, 30 years ago or mechanical ventilation 50 years ago. <laughs> and uh, at this point, too, people wondered whether they should continue with uh, mechanical ventilation because of uh, the complication of BPD. Uh, similar um, doubts may come uh, up in cell therapy. But there are different types of stem cells. It's really important that you know what stem cell you, are, you have what it can do and what it cannot do, because there's a lot of hype around stem cell uh, therapy. And there's also a proliferation of uh, um, unproven uh, stem cell therapy. And uh, it used to be called stem cell tourism because uh, these patients that are de um, um, uh, devastated or desperate uh, would go to um, uh, Mexico or other offshore uh, countries in the Caribbean to get uh, stem cell injections. But now you have these um, um, stem cell clinics in the US, in Canada, and, uh, and all over Europe. Um, and so this is a potential risk uh, for uh, the careful assessment of uh, stem cell therapy, whether truly they have the potential uh, for organ repair. I showed you that stem cell dysfunction could contribute to disease, and this forms the rationale for supplementation with healthy stem cell. And uh, as I told you, much more needs to be learned about the biology of these um, um, cells, and I hope you got that from this um, presentation. And uh, progress with what we call today a disruptive technology should always be informed by uh, rigorous studies in the lab, but also in the clinic. Uh, this is the analogy that I like to do uh, about the disruptive technology of stem cell biology. Uh, this is the evolution of uh, uh, cell phones. And uh, I can see some in the audience that have definitely known uh, this uh, clunky cell phone uh, that had only one function, making a call. And uh, it was featured in the 1980s Wall Street movie. It was Michael Douglas um, walking in uh, Central Park and we were mesmerized by the cell phone. It took 30 years, 30 years, to get to the fancy smartphones that we are accustomed to today. And this is just technology. So it's very likely that it will take us 30 years to harness the true potential of, uh, um, of, of, of stem cells. Uh, but if we use cautious and rational steps, we will, we will get there. 
And uh, um, just two more slides uh, showing the complexity and again the pertinence of the analogy with uh, cell phones, cell manufacturing. It is, will be crucial when you, we use um, stem cells because the process is the product. As I will show you the promise of cord-derived mesenchymal stromal cells in the afternoon, any step in this process from collecting the MSCs to isolating them, expanding them, um, and then uh, freezing them until use will affect the quality of, uh, the, um, uh, of the product. And the question is, can we make it at a scale, at a clinical scale, uh, so that we have good quality mesenchymal stromal cells. It is by analogy of making an outstanding moussaka. <laughs> There's no better moussaka than that that, that uh, our grandma was doing, well, not mine specifically. But, uh, and uh, you can imagine now if you want to make moussakas for one million people, uh, can you maintain the same quality? And this is the same uh, um, problem or challenge here that we have with, with cells. Now, we'll show you this afternoon uh, a roadmap to hopefully successful translation of cell-based uh, therapy with uh, the classical stages of a discovery of stem cells. Uh, here I show you that, uh, in addition, you have the challenge of making a cell product, manufacturing, to explore st exploratory studies that pr show proof of concept in animal models. But then you need these confirmatory studies that often are shunted uh, because of the excitement of moving into the clinic. And it is important to use another animal species, ideally a large animal model, to show feasibility, safety. You don't necessarily to show efficacy uh, because this is what your clinical trial will be, uh, will be doing. And Dr. Speer showed very nicely uh, the evolution that the surfactant has gone through and uh, how many questions were then uh, still answered in clinical trials that we couldn't gather from uh, the animal studies. And then we would move to clinical trials, the classical phase one to phase uh, 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 four uh, uh, trials and registries for stem cell. We have uh, added the what we call the incubator concept because usually the step from here to here crosses two valleys of death, where usually very promising therapies uh, don't make it. And here we have partnered with our method center at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, uh, where we perform not just the clinical systematic reviews that Dr. Speer also showed you how important they are to summarize the knowledge in the most transparent and rigorous fashion, but we also do these uh, systematic review and meta-analysis for preclinical studies. And this really unmasks how little we, how poorly we perform at the bench. And I say it because I can include my lab in that. And then we perform also knowledge translation. Here was Mireille. We did uh, some interesting studies looking at what do pa pa parents actually think about uh, giving stem cells to babies. Is this a crazy idea? And uh, this helps uh, in uh, enhancing the enrollment, which is often uh, a failure of clinical trials. We do an early economic evaluation to see what is the headroom analysis and can, is this strategy actually economically viable. And then um, uh, we do a, a retrospective or prospective cohort study to test the trial and see if we have it um, uh, right. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I hope that I can answer some questions.